Hi! This is Jared, and today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest hymn writers of all time, arguably the greatest, Isaac Watts. <laughs> this is part four of four. Let's get to it. All right, this one's a winner. We're geared up, ready to go. Well, it's good to see you back here. My name is Jared, and this is In Him, a channel where we talk about music-related topics. And today, we are talking about the one of the greatest hymnists, if not the greatest hymnist of all time, Isaac Watts, on this edition of a hymnist history. <laughs> that was a mouthful, wasn't it? A lot of what I say in this video, I'm going to be referencing Martin Luther and, and the video that I did on him. And so if you haven't had the opportunity to check that one out, I'll leave a link in the description below just so that you don't get lost or you don't get confused about some of the references I make. But today we're talking about Isaac Watts. And let's just go ahead and get into it. I'll give you his dates. Uh, Isaac Watts was born 1674 and lived till 1748. Now, Isaac Watts is known as the father of English hymnody, and that's for many reasons that we'll get into, but when he was born, he was born into this kind of era where uh, the Anglican Church had already broken from the Catholic Church, and so England had, had created and solidified the Church of England. So this is kind of the environment that Isaac Watts grew up in. His father was a dissenter. In fact, it's said that he was born at a time when his father was jailed. And so he was nursed outside the prison, essentially. And so this is the kind of environment that he grew up in, this environment of dissension from the Anglican Church, from the Church of England. And so uh, it's not a surprise that Isaac Watts himself became what's known as a dissenter, someone who was against the practices of the uh, Anglican Church. Isaac Watts is known widely as someone of great intellect, and in fact, the word genius is thrown around when you talk about Isaac Watts in some circles. Now, it's not clear to me what his IQ was, let's say, his classical uh, intelligence quotia, or whatever, quotient, uh, quota, I don't know, it's one of those. Whatever the case is, whatever IQ actually stands for, uh, <laughs> it's not known his exact, uh, uh, the metric on that as far as he's concerned, but it's very clear that he was a person of high intellect. Well, for one, he was somebody who knew several languages. He uh, knew English, he could speak French and Latin, and knew Greek and Hebrew, all by the age of 13. Most of them he knew before he was 10, and so he spoke many languages, he wrote le several languages, he read in many languages, like you might expect from a classical scholar. And so, it's no surprise that people took note of his intellect, even as a child, and were offering him scholarships and opportunities to go to some very prestigious schools and universities after he got done with his, his, his education as a child. And <laughs> because of his uh, his dissentership, let's say, he either rejected those offers to go to places like Oxford uh, or was not ultimately accepted in places like that because of his ideology and his theology regarding the Anglican and Church of England, uh, the Church of England. And so uh, there's some scholarship on both sides of that. Most of them say that he just rejected those scholarships and those opportunities to go to those more prestigious schools uh, and instead ended up going to a very popular dissenter college. And so that's where we kind of pick up this story, uh, where he goes to this the, the lesser college but ends up being hyper-successful. And so I think that's something that we can take away from today. What's the best route for you if you're a high school kid? Well, maybe it's not the path that you think it is. Maybe it's the, the, the school that people are looking down on, or maybe it's a trade school. Maybe it's something that's, that's outside the world of academia. You never know, especially in our system today of, of universities. It seems uh, pretty broken. <laughs> <laughs> and so it might be a good good time to revamp your options and be like Isaac Watts and not look at what everyone else is telling you to do and what everyone thinks is necessarily the good idea. Sometimes growing with the herd is not necessarily the best thing to do. At any rate, there's no one who, who, who looks at Isaac Watts and says, uh, this was not a scholar, because most of the work that he did was towards scholarship. Although he was a, 
uh, a pastor he, of a church. He was a well-known speaker and lecturer. Most of what he devoted his time to was scholarship. And I think that plays out in the things that he ended up creating because, well, for example, he wrote the book on logic. I mean, the actual textbook, the, the textbook that universities, the same universities that, that he didn't end up going to, ended up using for probably about a hundred years after its publication. And the textbook was actually titled Logic. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll be able to throw up the full title. That was the, the, t the title, but the subtitle is much longer than that, as you can see. And so this textbook that he wrote on, on, uh, on logic, on how to rationalize and think for yourself, and, and how to dispense, or not dispense with, but rather live into scientific inquiry, as well as spiritual inquiry, what's the processes for thinking about these things. Uh, he was obviously a person who, who thought deeply about this, this thing called logic, and I think that plays out in the person of Isaac Watts. Now, all of this said, uh, he was a very, a very small man, a man of small stature, uh, reaching about what, what most accounts say five foot, and so he was, by, by our modern standards at least, fairly small and frail as well. You'll see, I think I've sh shown you some portraits up to this point already, and maybe I'll throw another one up here, and you can see that most of the portraits of him show him with these large, overgrown robes that have many folds in them, and most people think that is to cover up his, his, his minuscule and diminutive stature because he was plagued by health concerns all throughout his life, not just physical, but emotional and psychological as well. So much that it's said that, it, that the psychological aspects of, to his health is ultimately what led him to give up his preaching assignments and ultimately led to his death in 1748. But all of that said, his impact was great, much greater than I think even he realized and recognized in his time. He's known as, as I've said before, the father of English hymnody, and for great reason, because he was an advocate of what we would consider uh, to be poetic, sacred music, what we consider to be classical hymns. Because up to this point, what was sung in the congregations at the time were what we would consider psalms, would, was psalmody, where the, the lyricists would directly translate the psalms and would maybe change a couple words here and there, but mostly they were translations, direct quotations from the psalms, and that was what was used in the, the congregational worship at the time. Uh, say, you know, John Calvin, for example, the Calvinist strain of the Protestant Reformation uh, was, was exclusively saying the Psalms. And so they had a psalm book, and that's what they sang. It was just English translations of the Psalms. But Isaac Watts uh, was radically different in, in his ideology and theology of this, of this. mostly because his major qualm was that it disregarded the New Testament and focused only on Old Testament accounts. And so, <laughs> you can imagine this kind of idealism and, and ideology really drew some criticism from the folks around him and from other denominations, because what even to the point where they started calling Isaac Watts's hymns Watts whims, uh, you know, as a play on words for the word hymn, but, uh, <laughs> and this, this likely made him very upset and, and distressed him greatly, his, this mockery from his peers and from other folks in his community. Uh, but he kept on, he pursued, uh, ultimately writing about what we know to be about 700 hymns total in his output, which is a great number. Let's see how it stacks up against the rest of them. Let's think back to uh, Martin Luther, who wrote, let's be generous and say, maybe 100. It's more likely it was in the 80s, but maybe let's say 100 hymns. Now, Isaac Watts, you know, uh, essentially uh, 7x'd that 700 hymns. 
and I take a look at, at the next closest person, which would have been Charles Wesley with his 8,000 hymns, nearly 9,000, but uh, he was in, in second place to Fanny Crosby, who wrote well over 9,000 hymns. So Isaac Watts definitely wasn't in first place, but he certainly wasn't in last place either. 700 hymns is nothing to wag a finger at, especially when you consider uh, these titles within there. Titles like Joy to the World, Alas and Did My Savior Bleed, and of course, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. From When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, it's, it's lines like these, it's, it's stanzas like these that really show off his grasp of the English language and his propensity, his, his direction and passion for verse. This is out of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It says, See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? And then another stanza, his dying crimson, like a robe, spreads o'er his body on the tree. Then I am dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. It's this hymn that Charles Wesley is fa had famously said at some point that he would have traded his entire output if he could have written this one hymn when I survey the wondrous cross. And so it's no wonder why Isaac Watts is regarded as the father of English hymnody because he was probably not the first to advocate this, but he was likely the first and most important one to actually walk the walk as he talked the talk because of output like this and output like joy to the world and output like alas and did my savior bleed. He led other people, he blazed the trail for people like Charles Wesley to, to write in poetic verse and not just translate the Psalms. Because what happens is he injects these new hymns, these true hymns of praise and adoration to God that's not dictated by Psalms specifically, but is quoted from other parts of the, of the Bible, but also is focused on the New Testament message, which is the person of Jesus Christ. And so you see this person, Jesus Christ, come out in these verses, joy to the world, the Lord is come in the Christ child, the babe that we sing on Christmas and uh, on Christmas tide and up to Epiphany. And so, alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Did he devote that sacred head to such a worm as I? Oh, yes, the worm line, right? That's the one that mostly gets stricken out of the hymnals. And I just love it so much because it speaks to the common man, especially at this time in England. That's why I think it caught like wildfire, while, why this, this trail was blazed so strongly and, and cleared out the brush and cleared out the naysayers and why Isaac Watts' hymns are still sung to this day, even all these years, all these centuries later, that we still sing, revere, love this hymnody because he spoke in a way that spoke to the common person. He spoke in a way that we could understand. And uh, some of these verses fell short. Some of his rhymes were a little in, you know, I, I don't know, they weren't super duper poetic, but it was because he was really trying to put it down in a way that everyone could relate to, in a way that was beautiful and pleasing and was directed toward congregational worship of the person of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the psalmist, you know, David, who was directed toward the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> he didn't know the salvation of Jesus. He didn't know the, the sacrifice of, of Jesus Christ on the cross. What he knew was God the Father, uh, who protected him in battle and in war times. And so it just is a, it's one of the other three, the triune God that, that David worshipped uh, and that is missing in those psalms. Although he was a god after God's own heart, as the scriptures say, it's, it's, it's so powerful that Isaac Watts was able to live into David's, uh, let's say, heritage of, of, of original praise and adoration for God. 
And so he creates his own hymn books, he creates original poetry and praise for God for use in the English congregations at the time, and his impact was felt from then on. Of course, he's post Martin Luther, and so Martin Luther was a man who advocated for this thing. He just didn't end up doing it as widely or as strongly as Isaac Watts was actually able to. While Martin Luther was able to talk the talk, most of his repertory was uh, transcriptions of the Psalms. He came from that Catholic tradition and, and was so close to that tradition that it was hard for him to break away. But Isaac Watts dedicated his entire output to original composition. And so I think that is why people like Charles Wesley and later Fanny Crosby, who we've both uh, discussed on this channel, uh, were able to do the things that they were able to do. So that's Isaac Watts's impact on, on specifically English hymnody, but of course all of hymnody and all of hymnody going forward past that, that time. He was able to take Martin Luther's ideologies and make them a reality in England. And for that, we thank Isaac Watts for his contribution and for the beautiful hymns that we still sing today. That's it for this hymnist history. If you want to check out the other ones, uh, parts one, two, or three up to this point, you're welcome to go back uh, and watch those. It's been a lot of fun, and I really appreciate all your support. If you'll take a moment and comment down which is your favorite hymn writer, maybe it's one that didn't make the list, and maybe we can continue, not the list of the greatest, but a list of uh, maybe some future videos about other hymn writers in the future. Anyway, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it, and go in peace.